It's the Hero Show. Welcome to the Hero Show, everybody. Starring the irrepressible Andrew Bernstein and the remarkable Robert Begley. I am Andrew Bernstein, and you are indubitably Robert Begley. How you doing today, Robert? I'm doing great, Andy. Ready? Last week I was reconstructed, right? That's how you introduced me? Well, today we're going to yes. talk a lot about reconstruction. And if we could go with the theme of U.S. Grant, part one was unconditional surrender. I would say part two is let us have peace, which was his motto when running for the president. So, yes, that's, let's move uh, on. You know, yeah, that's, that sounds right. Uh, Grant, I, know, I think you know a lot more about Grant's bio than, than I do. I, I know that he was a commander of the U.S. Army after the Civil War, right? And yes. got a long work, had a working relationship with President Andrew Johnson for a while. And then it all went to, and it all went to pieces, right? So yeah. where, should we, where, should, where should we pick up? Uh, Let's you know, start right prior, off. Just prior to the Grant presidency. Sure. The four years before he became Johnson's administration was was a mess. And the, one of the first things Johnson wanted to do was have Robert E. Lee hanged. And well, that's right. Yeah. Grant was the one who said, no, he would never have shaken my hand and signed the peace agreement if um, if he knew he was going to be hanged. So we can't we can't do that. And the two of them, that was the first like real breach in the relationship and it didn't uh didn't really get that much better over the course of Johnson's administration uh of course Grant's position was if he, he would have never surrendered more of the union soldiers would have died and the war would have continued to drag on so you can't uh kill Robert E Lee right you know right after yeah, yeah. Uh, the war and, Go ahead. Right, and, and you're right. They they had a handshake agreement, and Grant was not yes. gonna Grant was not gonna go back back off on that, and and Grant turned out later to be a, a fairly astute politician. Uh, you, you know, if you want to yeah. make peace with the South and you want to reintegrate the South into the Union as as one United States, you really want to start off by hanging a real Southern hero. You know, a man. <laughs> Who, whatever his flaws and his errors, uh, was a man of integrity, was a man of principle, was was a good man. That's not the way to start off reconstructing the South. And I doubt, I mean, I, I doubt Abraham Lincoln, if he were alive, would have would have pushed that kind of, you know, would, would have pushed that kind of action. There's no way to be sure, but it's that was not Lincoln. Lincoln's policy towards the South was to be much more lenient. I don't think he wanted to hang Robert E. Lee. No, no. And so not to go too long over the Johnson administration, but basically th there were a lot of scandals and he ended up getting impeached and Grant was one of the reasons why. He just didn't didn't trust him, didn't think he was good for reintegrating the South into the Union. So by the time we come to 1868, the election, Grant is pushed into it. Just a for context, presidents didn't run on their own. They didn't, they, they even back then, even uh, in the mid to late 19th century, uh, some of them did, but actually I should say, Grant never ran. He always wanted someone else to push him forward for that position. He wanted it, but he wasn't the person to go out and uh, say, yes, I should be the next president. And when election he time came- He wasn't was, like- he he wasn't like his buddy, right, William Tecumseh Sherman, with his immortal line that if nominated, I will opposite. not run, and if elected, yes. I will not serve. Right, Sherman didn't want. Yeah, him. Well, uh, but but yeah, but Grant no, and did. I think Sherman learned from Grant the headache, the headache that politics gave uh, gave you. It wasn't all, you know, it wasn't all it was cracked up to be. But Grant knew that he was the man. One of the things he did in the Johnson administration was tour the South and see the, the people and just gain an appeal as a leader, as a potential leader of the United States. And so he took even several Southern states in that election as well, which was, you know, if you remember, Abraham Lincoln didn't take any Southern states. So that's already a sign of progress. 
And once Grant uh, becomes the president, let us have peace was his, that was his motto uh, for um, his campaign slogan, basically. And you could say it's, it's a simple slogan, but you know, at the time of a vicious five-year war, the buildup to the war, and now how will you peacefully integrate the states and then also the 15th Amendment, which was right. one, of the, one of the major accomplishments uh, during his presidency. Yeah. So all of these things yeah. came into, right. into play uh, straight on right. for Grant. Well, right, and we, should, and we should point out, let us have peace includes, uh, you know, a message to the Ku Klux Klan, right? Well, was, uh, yes. uh, that was violently yes. intimidating and murdering Republicans and, and, and Black voters to try and keep the yeah. old, you know, white supremacists really were powerful back then you know the the plantation class and their supporters wanted to you know wanted to keep uh black americans down deny them deny them the vote they were murderers the clan were murderers and, uh, and that's not peace they, they you definitely... know that's not that's not peace yeah. when you know when, when 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 one party the republicans and their and the black voters who supported them are intimidated fully uh beat up and even murdered by this terrorist, this homegrown terrorist organization. So I, well, one of the great accomplishments of the Grant administration, I'm sure that you know, we'll get into, is he had his attorney general you know, vigorously prosecute the, the KKK. Yeah, we can even talk about that now, Andy, since, since we're on it, the, yeah. the KKK Act. It, was, it would actually have a name, the, the Ku Klux Klan Act. And it was a big part of who he was you can't suppress the the voters' rights. You can't intimidate people. You can't kill people wantonly. And uh, Grant was a staunch opponent uh, of this, and even outlawed, you know, wearing costumes. I mean, that was even one of the provisions that you're not even allowed to wear the 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 white hood and robes. So. Uh, major accomplishment. We can say, you know, if we look at highlights and lowlights, Andy, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the floor in a second. That was absolutely one of the highlights of his administration yeah. was showing, uh, the, squashing the Klan as far as could be done and g empowering the Blacks to have the vote now. Yeah. And, right. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. Can, you can. You can. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Right squashing right. the Klan. You know, sadly for the time being, because they kept. Yes. You know, they, they were like the Hydra. As the decades went by, they kept uh, re reappearing. And in the nineteen twenties, uh, you know, according to uh, yeah. an essay I saw in in the the Atlantic, which may not be the most reputable source, uh, you, you know. But still, it's the information I have. In the 1920s, early 1920s, when the white population of the United States was roughly 95 million, the Klan members, there were several million, several million members of the Klan. Now, nobody knows for sure, but it, you know, it, it had a re recrudescence, you know, unfortunately. And, but, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's, it's uh, uh, good news is it's, you know, very, very, very marginalized in our day. But you know, it had several re reappearances oh, yeah. in American oh, yeah. history. But uh, but yeah, Grant squashed it in 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 his time, uh, which was a, a major accomplishment. And you're right. And and we should say something about the Fifteenth Amendment. I know I know you mentioned it, mm -hmm. but that Go ahead, that yeah. protected yeah that protected uh, that that banned states or or the federal government from violating voting rights that 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 protected the voting rights of all Americans uh black Americans as you know as as well as whites and that was this was a you know a major step forward we know again through the Jim Crow era uh to come that you know after Grant was was dead not only out of office but dead that you know that the the voting rights of black Americans were severely suppressed in the in the uh southern states 1965, the Freedom Ball. We we celebrated Martin Luther King for this. For voting rights yeah. was still suppressed uh, in, in Southern states. 100 yeah. years after the, after the the Civil War ended, 100 years after the 13th Amendment, and, and it's like 100 years. Uh, uh, but um, yeah, the 15th Amendment. It took a long time, uh, you know, to guarantee voting mm -hmm. rights for for Black American citizens. But the 15th Amendment was an important step, and Grant supported it vigorously. Yeah. Actually, you said 1965, Andy, in 1875, while he was president, he he 
promoted the Civil Rights Act. Okay, it it didn't it didn't really gain traction, but he really wanted that full empowerment. That was that was what he uh, certainly stood for. Now, one thing about Grant's presidency and his life in general is that he he, um, he trusted a lot of people. He it's interesting, Andy. If you if you go like internally, I'm sure this has happened to you. But if you if you're an honest good person, you tend to think until you get really burned over and over again. You tend to think so are your fellow people that you surround yourself with, and in that sense. A lot of the scandals that happened during his presidency came about that way, that he trusted people who were not, they were just not honest. And he put them in, in positions to uh, take advantage of his name, his prestige, his honesty and, and integrity and moral worth. And several of those things backfired on him. I'll just, I'll just go quickly with two of them. One of the first things was the Transcontinental Railroad. As soon as he became president, the two Union Pacific, Central Pacific met in, where's that, Utah, Promontory? Yeah, Promontory, um, Utah, Utah. The place with, yeah, yeah so right. so that was like one of his, he, he was a pro-industrial president, pro-industrial man. He was, he was totally in favor of industry. And the railroads were a big part of that. Uh, but one of the scandals during his presidency was the Credit Mobilier, uh, where a lot of the Union Pacific uh, management got in, basically got in bed with the government to get these contracts and to jack up the prices and what we know as cronyism. They were complete cronyists, and Grant did not. You know, certainly didn't sanction that, but it happened under his administration, and that was, uh, you know, that was one of the scandals. Uh, another one was um, the gold, the, the Erie Railroad scandal of of Jay Gould and um, Fisk, Jim Fisk, where they wanted to corner the gold market. Uh, <coughs> interesting. Grant, he was in favor of gold and sound money because if you remember, they we didn't really talk about this, but printing the greenbacks and printing paper mm -hmm. money, he knew he knew fiscally that uh, he was for free trade and sound money. You know, two things that are that are um, we know the they're value vital. of them today. Some some of us yeah, know the value of them today, they're, but back well, they're then, vital for yeah. they're vital for the success of a capitalist economy. Absolutely. That, that's right. That's right. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. So those were two things, uh, two scandals that were uh, a big part of his administration. And he took the blame for it. And of course, the, the media who did not like him still referred to him as a drunk. They still uh, they found all these ways to try, try to undercut him. And it was media in the North and, and the South uh, for his second his second presidential nomination, he ran against Horace Greeley, who had his own newspaper and was uh, somewhat of a socialist. And, and uh, Grant soundly de uh, defeated Greeley and continued on to try to, if we look at empowerment, the wow. Indians, he wanted good treaties with the Indians. Uh, the Blacks were coming. He was hiring them. He, they, he was giving them positions of power in the government whether Indians, uh, the Blacks, he advocated women's suffrage. Uh, nothing happened during his lifetime. So these were parts of his administration. The, these were successes of his administration that, um, you know, that, that we can say for a two-term president. And, and by the way, from Andrew Jackson, which is mid-1820s, to Woodrow Wilson, there was not a two-term elected president who filled out both you know, both terms. So this is very rare that Grant is, is, it's like an 80 to 90 year period where there's only one other two term elected president. So that, well, that says something for. Well, let, yeah. me, let me, let me jump here for a second. Grover Cleveland served two terms, right? But I think they were not, they were not contiguous. Is that not consecutive? Is, is that yes. Consecutive? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And, and Frank and, and uh, Teddy Roosevelt was almost two full terms because, um, Yes, McKinley was assassinated. Harding got assassinated he, uh, yeah, shortly after his election. And uh, and Lincoln McKinley. won two terms, no, won no, twice, no, but didn't fill out, you know. Right. 
So McKinley, McKinley was assassinated. I mean, and then Teddy Roosevelt filled Oh, uh, right. Harding was, was that's yeah. right. Harding yeah. was later. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, no, that, that, that's okay. But I just want to mm -hmm. make a couple of couple of points. Horace Greeley. Yeah, that was the New York Herald. Was his newspaper? Is as I recall, his statue right? is that, just yeah, the, the, yeah, Greeley Greeley Square. Square. In New York. Yeah, right. Um, but he's he's known in American history today for his famous exhortation: "Go west, young man." So I, you know, he realized that, that's a good you know, one. The, yeah, it is. It is that the West was you know this. This bo the, uh, had these booming possibilities for, for Americans mm -hmm. to make you know to make a a good life for themselves and and so that, that's that's yeah. that's what what Greeley is, is I think that's what Greeley's remembered for. Also, I want to say you know you talk about Grant, you know trusting you know, other people. There's an interesting I think philosophic psychological point here, and that is you know we have privileged access into our own consciousness. You know, we can introspect and, 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 and know ourselves. So we, we have the opportunity to know ourselves much better than we, than we can know anybody else. And I think, I think what you said is true, that we expect other people to be like us, you know, the person, the person we know best. And it's, it's, you know, it's like criminals very often will not trust anybody because they expect other people to be like You're them. Right. You know, you know, and honest right, people totally. will, will, will trust. Yeah, honest people very often will trust other people because they also they expect other people to be like them. So yeah, yeah, uh, honest people can get victimized then by you know by swindlers and, and connivers. Uh, so, sounds like that's what happened yeah. to Graham. Well, yeah. still and one of, one of the, the yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Sorry. Robert. No, no, no. Yeah, I was going to say one of the other thing, really important things, was uh, separating church and state in education. Now, for, unfortunately, the wave was going towards compulsory education and Grant didn't really fight that, but he made it clear that religion should be separate. It should be, a, it's a private right. matter. It should not be part of the education, uh, uh, as formal education. And uh, he took some flack for that, you know, and I, I think he was definitely ahead of his time with that. So a lot of you know, and, you know and, still would, and still would today if if Grant if the Grant yes. you know was was a big issue today we'd still take flack for that in the Bible you know various Bible Belt states yeah but you know that's right but he's, that's right but he's but he's right he's not trying to restrict religious families from instructing their children at home or sending them to church or sending them to Sunday mm -hmm. school. He's saying the yeah. the the schools. This is this, he's a, he's a hero, you know. For, for, not just for that, but the schools should be for academic subjects. The schools should be to teach you know students yeah. how to think and you know and 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 learn content, you know, the content subjects, which is you know a major problem today. Although you know for other reasons. So you know, Grant's right on on both. Yeah. Religion is a private yeah. matter. Schools should be the schools should be for teaching you know cognition. Yeah. Exactly. And my last yeah. point on during his presidency, if we look globally now, what what's, you know, foreign policy, what, how do you act on that? Well, there were two things. One was the British helped the South. They were building ships that the South was right. using right. to fight the North. So in effect, Britain was at war with the United States and that right. did not go over well. I, I think I mentioned on a previous episode that William Seward was the one that said, you know, tell you what, just give us Canada and we'll wash our hands. <laughs> <You're> right, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> well, they didn't do that, but they did give 15 million. It's called the Washington Treaty. And they right. gave the United States $15 million in reparations for, for the damage. Uh, you know, can't replace lives, but there was something there. So America is saying to the world, you know, don't mess with us. We, we know, in fact, Grant at the time said, we are the richest and freest people on, in, on the planet. Well, he wouldn't say on the planet, in the world, but we don't know it. So in other words, like America didn't have really a global vision. Americans really didn't have that global vision. And we'll get, we'll get to this after his presidency ends um, more about that. But Grant recognized that. And so now we're we're more on the world stage that we're going to take. Britain was the top country globally at that time, you know, mid nineteenth sure. century. The sun never set, right, on, on, on British territory. Britannia, and Britannia was, rules the waves, yeah. right? Britannia, the sun. You're right. Sun never sets yeah. on the British Empire, which was literally true. Yeah. 
Uh, right. This is when they were when great. The sun, they're, they're not great anymore. Yeah, the, they, they used to be. <laughs> when the sun, yeah, yeah. Uh, when the sun set in Great Britain, it was shining in India, right? So you know that was that was literally yeah. true. Uh, but yeah, uh, so the United States, um, you know, the the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the United States occurs during Grant's presidency. He's president of 1869 to 1877. This is, yeah. you, you mentioned it before, and the United States is soon to become the world, but, you know, before the turn of the 20th century, which is just, you know, 23 years after Grant's presidency ends, the United States is soon to become the leading yeah. industrial power mm -hmm. in the in the country. So, so yeah, Grant is right about that. But I'm, I'm sorry, go the, ahead, Robert. Yeah, no. And then the last global point was he saw the importance of a canal and between Nicaragua and Panama, there, there were there were arguments for both sides. And Vanderbilt, who we mentioned during the Vanderbilt episode, that he, he loved Grant, and uh, they both loved riding horses. Um, and he, but because it was proposed by the French, the the Panama Canal, Grant wanted nothing to do with it. He said, no, this should be an American activity. So the French tried for another like 30 years, bankrupted the entire country. And then uh, beginning of the 20th century, America <clears throat> took over and finished the job properly. So globally, you know, we're, we're becoming more that way. And even Hawaii, uh, he interacted with the, I don't I can't remember if it was like an emperor, but in Hawaii, they still had the kind of an old world rule but he wanted free trade he wanted expansion in that sense and to partner with hawaii and even santo domingo in the, in the caribbean as well so he he was starting to think globally as for america as a, a, a global power and global trading uh, power so though to me those are a lot of the the legacy of of grant's presidency and if we look at why is it why why doesn't he rank up there when when we think of presidents well there was a, a lot of historians <clears throat> would total they lionize robert e lee i mean <laughs> they forget that grant was the one who saved his life but they just glorified him and you talked last time andy about gone with the wind and this whole view of the south this whole idealized version of what slavery was like and, and that really gained power and so the legacy of grant in many people's mind is still a drunkard and scandals left and right so mm -hmm. i think those things diminished his standing but, yeah i get you know there's one no reason. no you i think i think you're absolutely absolutely right although grant's reputation has been rising steadily amongst uh, uh american historians yes. in 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 recent decades in recent years yes like fortunately yeah mm -hmm. yeah his, his uh, just 30 years ago his he was ranked like 30 something out of all the american presidents and now today it's like he's ranked like number number 21 so his 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 reputation is rising at the same time i mean that's a good thing two thumbs up for that at the same time, i don't want to lionize american historians either a lot of them are you know no, are no. intellectuals with very very bad premises and so you know, yes. you know I, I it may still be the case that um i i remember when i was a kid you know abraham lincoln was generally considered the greatest president george washington was generally considered number two i would reverse that in my limited uh, mm -hmm. knowledge of american history mm -hmm. i would have washington one and lincoln two but i think fdr mm -hmm. was generally you know considered the, the the third greatest president i would consider one of the yeah. worst for any number of reasons so Absolutely. so i'm I glad agree. to see yep. i'm glad to see grant's reputation rising but i'm also not you know put my stock in in the assessment of modern intellectuals including you know history professors uh but anyway uh, 100% yeah. agree, Andy. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but you know, one what, what thing, thing you touched upon that I think we should uh, uh, discuss a little bit more was his attitude towards uh, the American Indians or Native Americans in today's yeah. politically yeah. correct, mm -hmm. woke parlance. And by the way, mm -hmm. let me say something about the locutions here. Uh, why I prefer American Indian to, to Native American. Now, we, we know that these tribes are not from India. So American Indian is a misnomer, but Native Americans has a real politically correct, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> agenda 
packed into it, trying to smuggle in the idea that these tribes were indigenous to the North American continent. And they most certainly were not. And my students, when I tell my students, college kids, they graduated from high school. When I tell them that these tribes migrated from Central Asia, they, they were flabbergasted. They, you know, they thought they were indigenous to the to the North American continent. They're not. Now, of course, they were here long before the Europeans. That's for sure. There's no, you know, no, no doubt about that. But Native Americans, I think, mm -hmm. is a American Indian is a, is a misnomer. Native Americans, I think, is a dishonest term. You know, and I, uh, you, know, you know, and I don't, I don't use it. But anyhow, yeah. the, the, you know, uh, Grant's Grant's attitude. Where, I don't know whether he explicitly, overtly supported you know, celebrated the principle of individual rights, but at least implicitly, he, at the very least, he grasped it implicitly because he, he wanted to protect the right of American Indians to assimilate into American culture. Right? And, and, and Thank you. I think that was, Thank you, Andy. I, yeah. Right. Go, yeah, go ahead. Continue. Yeah. No, I was so, going to say, I want you to elaborate on assimilation, on, on the concept, because that's okay. exactly what he, that's one of my bullet points. Assimilation, have Andy talk. <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. I, well, I mean, American culture is, uh, has all these opportunities, all, you know, all, these, uh, all these advances. Ass assimilation sim simply means the right of uh, you know, an honest person, in this case, you know, in, in, in the, you know, he doesn't have to live on the reservation. You know, it's not a ghetto like you know, the Europeans confined uh, centuries ago, a lot of the Jews to, to ghettos. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a ghetto. You could, you could leave forever if you want get a job go to school get get an education have your rights protected as a, as a citizen of, of the united states and then you know enjoy fully the all of the all of the great opportunities that that a free country like the united states has to offer that's that's what assimilation means that's the positive side now if if somebody wants to maintain say the their negative, say the negative well the negative yeah, side is about the negative yeah, the negative the negative uh, interpretation comes from an anti-American bias, and that is, you know, it's it's cultural colonization or cultural exploitation that, mm -hmm. you know, that you want mm -hmm. you want the American Indians to give up their culture, you know, and everything. Now, if I'm going to be brutally frank, you know, just completely honest, a lot of the Western tribes didn't have much of a culture. Uh, you know, a lot of some of the Eastern tribes did. They were farmers, and they they had yeah, they had developed ag agriculture. A lot of the Western tribes, the, the the Sioux, for example, well, were warriors. They were warrior culture. You know, hunters, gatherers, warriors. No written language. They didn't have much of a culture. Now, that's that's not even the main point. Because in a free country, if if so, if if, if so, you know, I went to college in South Dakota, you know, and I was you know the the, the, the big res the big reservation. You know, out at uh, uh, Pine Ridge, you know, in the in the Black Hills of, is, is the place. I mean, some of my friends were, were you know were from there. Uh, you know, and, and so a lot of the uh, the, the the Indians that will will leave the reservation, go to college, you know, and 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 have a you know a career in America. Now, if they want to maintain their culture, you know, and I guess there's not a lot of buffalo that they could hunt along the Great Plains anymore on horseback, but the culture. Uh, the culture is a warrior culture, and I think I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure yeah. about this, Robert, but I think it's true that a number of of uh, members of, of these Western tribes who were warriors joined the U.S. military, you know, and were war heroes, yeah. uh, you know, in in, yep. in in various wars, including including the second including the Second World War. Now that's a that's a way to assimilate into American culture that's maintaining the heritage of your ancestors, you know, who are mighty, you know, who are fierce warriors. Um, but yeah. the, the, this idea of cultural ex, expro, expropriation is false because in a free country, if somebody wants to glorify the, the culture of their ancestors, such as it was, mm -hmm. they're free to do so. You know, mm -hmm. my ancestors are East, East European Jews. Uh, I, I don't have much interest in, in what like, life was like on the shtetl, you know, for them. But, I, you know, if I wanted to, I, I could. Your ancestors were, you know, from Ireland and and Italy. If you wanted to, you know, celebrate those cultures, you're 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 free to do so. Uh, and and same for you know, same for the American Indians. If I was a if I was a kid growing up on the Pine Ridge Reservation, I'd want to get out of there, you know, and and uh, yeah, you know, have have an education and, yeah. and 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 participate fully in the in the fruits of you know American civilization. But in a free country, the right of any individual to glorify and 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 you know keep alive 
the culture of their ancestors is, is protected is by the principle of, of individual rights. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think Grant was absolutely right. To, Great to point, argue. Andy. Yeah. Grant was absolutely right. That's to, really you know, important to, to say. It, it, that's really important to, again, give the context because America is expanding and going back to Greeley, go West, young man. Well, there were other people there. And we, again, we talked in the Vanderbilt episode that it was dangerous during the gold rush. It was dangerous to go across the country and between the railroad and, and Grant's uh, presidential legacy is we need to deal with these people here. Okay. We need to deal with them peacefully as much as that can happen. Now, when Custer got killed, Battle of you know Little Big Bighorn, Grant blamed the outrage. They wanted vengeance. The Americans wanted vengeance. This is 1876. So this is actually Grant's right. last year as president. And it's all, and it's July 4th. It's the 100th anniversary. Uh, but Grant criticized Custer. He was like, he acted foolishly, recklessly. He shouldn't have done that. He, the command, the, the, the orders were to wait for her for the backup, but he wanted to be this, you know, this hero and just take right. on everybody by himself and pay the price. And he, and Grant did not want the repercussions to, to be taken out on, on the American Indians. That's what I'm just going to call them right now, you know, for, yeah. for the, for the, for the duration the, uh, on the American Indians. So settling yeah, West. Yeah, the thing, the thing about American things... Indian, the, the thing about American Indians, Robert, even though those tribes are not from India, at least they got the right continent. <laughs> you know, these Asian, these were Asian. <laughs> well, we blame Columbus. North you, I mean, we right. blame Columbus because he thought they were Indians. He's the one that really named them India because his he was sailing to find India, and so we we could blame a, a different hero for a different. <laughs> yeah, it's a an era, uh, an, an era. But these are Central Asian tribes, like you know, related yeah. to the to the Mon to the Mongols, in 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 uh, many cases, and like the Mongols. A lot of those tribes were mighty warriors. Uh, yeah, but, but I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. And again, I'm uh, I'm staying with the, I'm staying with the term that Grant used in his day as well. I'm staying in his within yeah. his context. So uh, he's finished two terms as president, 1876, and th there's some callings, rumblings for him to run a third term. He doesn't want to do it. This is one of the most disputed. Uh, elections, uh, Tilden versus oh, yeah, that's right. Rutherford B. That's Hayes. Right. You, know, you know, Robert, Robert before, it, before, before you, before yeah. you get into it, let me say one, one last thing about, about the, the Indians and, and, and Grant. Before, yeah, 1876 mm -hmm. was a brutally corrupt election, wasn't it? But um, before, before yeah. we get to that, um, we should point out, you know, there's a lot of anti-Americans, you know, today who will talk about, you know, how the, the Americans stole the land from you know, from these Indian tribes and, and, and everything. And so when you, you get, we uh, apply the full context here, a couple of points. First of all, there is not a, literally, there's no hyperbole here, literally, there is not a square inch uh, of ground anywhere on this earth that has not been conquered and reconquered and reconquered yes. over and over and over again in the context of, uh, of world history. So uh, you know, to single out the Americans for it, even, you know, as especially, you know, evil people, yeah. uh, even if it, even if it, the claims are accurate, is, is wrong uh, to start with. But, uh, but, uh, but on top of this, you're right, this, what, do you, what do you do? You have a much more advanced civilization than, than, than these tribes. The tribes are, are very warlike. Uh, it's very hard to, ha to have peace. Uh, with them. They don't want to give up their life. Okay, this is where they've been living for centuries, you hunting and fighting the other tribes mm -hmm. and everything. They don't, want, they don't want to give that up. But what's the morally right thing to do? You, negotiations with, with warrior tribes, mm -hmm. you know, who, who believe that their God gave them this land is very, very, is very, very difficult. And, and, and not for nothing, as they might say in my native Brooklyn, uh, a number of the Plains tribes I, I, I know the Crow and the Pawnee, but two, and I know there were others, sided with the U.S. Army in the struggle against the Sioux because the Sioux had been such brutal conquerors, uh, you know, yes. in, 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 in those territories. I guess it was a way it was similar to how Cortez conquered the Aztecs with like a hand, relative handful of guys because a lot of the yeah. other tribes sided with, with, uh, with the 
conquistadores, who were brutal guys. Yeah. But a lot of the other tribes sided with them because the Aztec had been such brutal conquerors, you know, of, of them. So, so, you know, so our good friend, Dr. Eric Daniels, American historian, said to me once yeah. in an immortal line, he said, history is messy. <laughs> you know, and and, yeah. and 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 it is, but um, for yeah. the most part, I think I think so, uh, so, uh, in my yeah, as a dilettante in American history, my my assessment would be some of the Eastern tribes may well have been victimized. You know, they they had they had agriculture, they had their own land, they had they had you know. I agree with John Locke on this that property rights you know involves building up building up the land, you know, improving it. Yeah. Uh, but for, tri for tribes who are nomads and wandering across thousands and thousands of acres, hunting the buffalo and warring against other tribes, does that constitute land ownership? I don't think so. Uh, no. I don't. I don't. No, they had so. no concept but, of property rights in 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 the tr in the way that Locke, you know, as you just mentioned, the way that Locke um, identified it. Uh, two quick things, and then we'll move on. But even during the Revolutionary War, the French and Indian War, they were Algonquins. You know, partner with the French to get at the Iroquois, you know, and, and vice versa with, with the British. So the British and French were fighting each other since 1066, you know, seven, six, seven hundred years. They come to, to the, the new Con world, William they're still the fighting Con each other. That's William They're the still Conqueror, fighting each other. Uh, and basically. they get yeah, exactly, yeah. And they get the two they they get the two different warring tribes to partner with them. So uh, Yeah, let me let me point yeah, something so, out. Let me let me point something, let me point something out here, Robert. Uh, I know we're a little bit off topic, but this is an important topic uh, subject. It needs to be discussed. It is. It yeah, is. The anti-American attitude amongst intellectuals today claims that the the, the uh, American Indian tribes were basically peaceful, a few skirmishes and battles here and there, but basically peaceful, got along with each other, and only when the white man came that you know that they they got drawn into the white man's wars. Now, there's a technical term in the field of philosophy for such a claim, and it's called bullshit, uh, because I know that's pretty that's pretty technical. You know, uh, Clark, Clark Whistler uh, was an anthropologist, you know, PhD in anthropology, Columbia University, a curator at the Museum of Natural History, uh, wrote a book. This goes back 1940s, I think, when, you know, they're still, still telling the truth about American history. Uh, Indians in the United States, I think, is the, mm -hmm. is the title. I got it used on Amazon. It's very good, very accurate. And, and, and Whistler, as an anthropologist, is very sympathetic to the American in, Indians. Well, he recognized these were warriors, man. These guys were warriors. The, the Iroquois had moved up into the centuries before the arrival of the Europeans. The Iroquois had moved up into the territory of the Algonquins from the south, and they weren't just intent on conquering those lands. They were intent on genocide. They wanted to wipe out the Algonquins to yes. the last man, woman, and child. They succeeded regarding some tribes. Uh, and who, sa mm -hmm. who saved the Algonquin? It was ironically the French of all people who arrived in the midst of all of this, needed Indian guides yeah. and armed the Algonquin with, with rifles, and guns and stuff that enabled them to defend themselves more effectively against the, you know, against the brutal Iroquois. So you know, a lot of these tribes were brutal, man. It's hard to, it's yeah. hard for a you know, a person to have a, a you know, rational person I think to have a lot of sympathy for them. The the best thing here is what Grant did. You know, the United States is is you know this this great country with us, a land of opportunity. You know, join join American culture, get an education, you know, get get a job, get, give up the old country ways in in effect. Like a lot of European immigrants came here, and, you know, even you know right. you know a lot of the European immigrants came here. They want to maintain their old country ways, but the children generally want to assimilate into into American culture. They want to be real Americans, learn the language. You know, uh, take advantage of that's American right. culture, all the opportunities. And Grant was welcoming to the American Indians uh, for that. And that's very rational. Yep. It's, it's very honest and it's very supportive yeah. of individual rights. And so I think I think Grant mm -hmm. deserves a lot of credit for that. Yeah, one of my favorite quotes of his in that context, he says, nobody should be judged on the basis of color, race, or religion. And that includes the... American Indians, that includes clearly the blacks, that includes uh, women, that includes Jews. He even changed his tune with Jews. We'll get, we'll and by the way, today, <laughs> today, 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 shocking enough, that would include white people, right? That would include the white people. Yes. But that's a complete individualistic yeah. approach. Yeah. That's exactly individualism yeah. and not collectivism. Yeah, he, he, totally he hired rejected. a lot of, right. 
he hired a lot of Jews uh, for, for various positions, right? Back at a time when the yes. Jewish population in the United States was probably tiny. You know, the, the real yeah. Jewish immigration. That was another came. global yeah. initiative. Uh, I'm sorry, Andy. That, that was another yeah. global. The Russian czar, I think 2,000 Jewish families he, he was uh, persecuting. And Grant went to bat for them. And they, you know, they, they, he made up for his mistake with the Jews during the Civil War, which we talked about last time. He, he made up, he, and, and in yeah. multiple, um, exponentially. But real fast, uh, 1876 election. It's a mess. It drags out. Uh, Tilden the, thinks he won. Turns out there was a compromise. They gave it to Rutherford uh, B. Hayes. With the compromise was the troops from the south, the northern troops have to leave the south, and reconstruction because was it a failure? Was it a success? Uh, south certainly didn't like there being uh, troops in their territory, but. Once that happened, basically it opened the door for Jim Crow. The, the, so that was part of the compromise, and and Grant kind of mediated over that. And he had, you know, he his his hands were tied uh, behind his back. So that's so after he's no longer president, he decides to take a world tour, and first time ever happened, and, and ex president, and he goes to the UK. He meets the Queen Victoria. He meets uh, the French nobility, Victor Hugo, he actually met. And Hugo, Hugo didn't oh, like him right? because of the, well, the he, Mexican Hugo didn't like him because this, what he, Cinco, he, he, he could, he during the like Civil War, Grant, Maximilian. Right. I was going to say Hugo didn't like him because Grant could outdrink him or what? Was, was that the reason? <laughs> <laughs> that I don't know. That no, I don't, that I don't know, it. but I do have another Hugo uh, integration. <laughs> but no, d the French were in Mexico during the American Civil War, and they, there was rumblings about getting jumping in, involved, uh, going into America. And uh, Grant was clearly critical of this, but Hugo was a was a nationalist in that sense. So he 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 was down on Grant for that one reason. But it turns out somebody gave Grant Les Mis the book. And asked him if he if he read it. He said, "I started the first few pages, but I just I got too interrupted too much." A couple of years later, he did read it. He absolutely loved it. He absolutely loved it. Uh, in France, he saw Napoleon's where Napoleon was buried. His wife. We didn't talk about his wife actually. She loved his presidency. She loved the fact of him, you know, the, the glory. And they had money for once because much much of their life they re they really really didn't have money. And she was a southerner, so there was a lot of this, <laughs> you know. And his father in law was still a, a, a Confederate, you know, till the day he died long really, after really. Grant's uh, presidency. Yeah, they yeah. Were, so they kind of even had that. <laughs> his wife came yeah. out of a slave-owning so slave family, right? Yeah, wow. yeah. And, and his father would sit outside the White House and in the waiting room. And when people would come in, he would trash. <laughs> he was like, no, my son-in-law is really a Confederate at heart, you know? He'd actually say this this but to what? people waiting. About the, the commander of the Union Army? Was who's really a confederate? Oh, boy, that's a that's a that's a stretch. The, the things you do for in-laws, you know. <laughs> My God. So he's doing this global tour, and again, it's never it's never been done, and it lasts two and a half years. He all over the world, everyone Bismarck, he meet Bismarck loved him. You know, asked him about battle, you know, battlefield uh, act, activities, and and. Um, so he's, he's after two and a half years, he's ready to come back. He doesn't know what he's going to do. He doesn't have a job. He doesn't have a position and he doesn't have an income. So, so what do you do? So they're telling him stay abroad because you might run, you know, the, the, the Hayes administration is not really working out here. So we might want you to run, uh, for the presidency, a third term after Hayes and he comes back and there's like a half-hearted attempt. He he did not, he didn't want to run for a third term unless he was pretty assured he would win. And that did not happen. He, he, so his name was put in the hat and it ended up being a Democrat. I can't remember now if it was Cleveland, uh, Grover Cleveland, who was the first Democrat to win bef since before Lincoln. You know, so right. it was a long, uh, a, a long row of Republicans and 
Um, so now he's, what does he do with, with, he's not president. He doesn't really have a job. He doesn't have an income and all of a sudden he's biting, he's eating, biting into a peach and something tastes funky and, uh, goes, you know, complains about it, tells his doctor and his doctor says, you have cancer and it's really bad and you're not going to last you're, you're not going to last long so now what do you do yeah this this was 1880s you know, with, where there was no treatment yes. for cancer back then even even no, today it was a death sentence you know, yes yeah sure even today 140 years later there's still a lot of people who die of cancer but today there are people who survive you know the you know yeah. there's treatment for cancer and there's a higher percentage of people yeah. surviving yeah, that's the good news. Yeah. But uh, 140 yeah. years ago, I mean, yeah, like you said, it was it was a death sentence. So he, um, so Grant, after his presidency, one of the things he did, he went back to Galena, Illinois, which is where he had a job in his the tannery right before Civil War broke out, and of course he's hailed as a as a, a celebrity. Um, Everywhere he goes, he's hailed as a you know as a gigantic, well well deserved hero, and because he would tell stories of the Civil War, and he would get animated and and real really uh, uh, be honest with his storytelling, not make himself like tower above everybody else, but because he was good at doing that, the idea um, I can't remember the publication, but they they approached him saying, why don't you write a series of these Civil War stories and we'll pay you. And he's like, okay, well, that's a way to make money because he looked, he right. liked literature. He didn't write, you know, he didn't really think he was uh, a better than average writer. But once this idea came to him, he's, he's gradually diminishing. Okay. His cancer is starting to take its toll and he's in pain. And then Mark Twain uh, meets him and Twain absolutely loved absolutely glorified him, idolized Grant. And, and he asked, Grant asks him, how, how much are they going to pay you? And Grant says, uh, I think like 10%. They want me to do my whole memoirs, in fact. And <laughs> Mark Twain says something to the effect that, are you kidding, 10%? That's like, that's like you're a housewife writing about, you, you know, raising children. You are, you as Grant, you know, your story is going to be read by millions of people. I'll tell you what, I'm starting my own publishing house. I'll give you 70% of the royalties. And Grant was a man of his word who had already promised this publishing house, but basically worked his way out of it. And Twain had a big part of that. So they decide, he decides that uh, he's going to be writing his uh, memoirs and he's doing it in New York. By the way, they settled into New York City the last uh, years of their life. A lot of wealthy New Yorkers took took care of them, uh, you know, as an act of uh, generosity. And, um, but he now comes the race with the clock. Can he do this book? Can he complete this book while still alive so that his family, his wife and children have some sort of income? So Elliot, if you could bring up that image now that uh, what he looked like towards the end of uh, his life. That is really sad. While he's writing his memoirs. Yeah. By hand. So Andy, what do you think? He, yeah. Heartbreaking, you, heartbreaking writing. and heroic. Heartbreaking and heroic. Yes. All all in one. Right? All in one. So he's writing his memoirs and they make this plan. This is the first campaign, publishing campaign in, in American history. They're gonna divide the country into sixteen segments and they're gonna have veterans sell door sell this book door to door and um basically he finishes three days three days after he finishes he dies okay so you, we could tell he lived to finish the book he hung on to finish the book this is heroism on a different scale now yes. it's like you're, you're, yes. you you got to get this out you want your legacy to be told but you want your family to earn an income Andy, 300,000 copies, $450,000 the family got, like the equivalent of like $12, $15 million today. in today's money the family got from the sales of this book. So 
he and he went only up to the civil war he didn't want to talk about his presidency so it's mostly uh some mexican war but the, but up to the civil war is what the memoirs are about highly highly recommended very literate um the, the i can't read it without thinking that this man is dying and he knows he's dying and he's and and you know sometimes he could only write 20 minutes a day because he was in so much pain and i mean that's you know that's one of the sad things with, with cancer we know people who've died from cancer and it's really hard you're in a lot of pain so what are you going to do you have yeah. to in his case and the, you have to distract the yourself and have a the, focus right the painkillers yeah. back then were primitive compared to what you know what could oh, be yeah. administered what could be administered today what do you do yo you drink a lot of booze uh, well, well, if you if you did that, that that affects your mind. You know, it makes it very difficult to write. But you know, as you were speaking, Robert, yeah. it, it, it occurred to me, fighting an unbeatable enemy. In this case, the Grim Reaper, right? He's fighting, you know, fighting the the death sentence that we all, you know, we're we're all under a death sentence. But uh, I don't want to be I don't want to be morbid here or pessimistic. Yeah. But 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 Grant's Grant's death is imminent right with an untreatable cancer uh in a lot of pain you know the confederacy was a formidable military foe but any human being can be defeated in this case the grim reaper can't be defeated it's it's an unbeatable enemy and yet he held he held the enemy off long enough to complete his goal and support his family this may have been the greatest heroic act of grant's life That's why I want the two episodes, Andy. It's like, we know him as a civil war guy. We don't know him that much as the, you know, the president because it's, it's marred. It's, it's decidedly mixed, whereas the civil war is not. But after that, you know, after that, how to deal with cancer and how to leave your stamp on the world uh, by writing your memoirs. And again, he criticizes himself. He, he, he doesn't, um, he doesn't glorify war you know he just tells it as he saw it and um it's again well worth the read because here's a man just telling a story in a, a chapter uh, an irreplaceable chapter in american history of this uh, complete struggle where uh, brother is fighting brother within the country and his humanity and his nobility in dealing with this and then similarly he transfers that to his dignity in in how he writes writes his book so yeah he he's gone and new york city up to that point one i think 1.5 million people uh were at his uh at his funeral uh immediately they made plans <clears throat> Oh, the pallbearers. So one of the Paul, Sherman was definitely one of them. From last week, if you remember Simon Bolivar uh, Buckner, the one who we owed money, the one who we first said unconditional surrender to from the South, he was one of the pallbearers. Like they wanted him to be sure there were Confederates there. There was a Jewish guy there. Pretty sure there might have been an American Indian there too. So he covered all the ground. The, the, the outpouring what frederick Douglass said about him what walt whitman said about him uh clearly what mark twain did you know the the incredible uh grief and after effect and then immediately they said where do we put him where do we put, how do we memorialize this man so elliot i'm going to ask you now to bring up <clears throat> there we go who's buried uh, in grand tomb, tomb. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm going to answer that, Andy. So I have to say on a personal note, in, in, when I was 26, I bought my first apartment in New York, 102nd and Broadway. And this is 122nd. It was one mile straight north, 122nd and Riverside. And whenever people come to visit, especially out of town, I bring them here and I'd show, I've been here hundreds of times. And the last one of Carrie and my last vi um, if activities in New York, I brought her there, but it was closed. Uh, the, the, COVID was already in, in process, but your answer is nobody. He's not literally buried. There were two caskets and I put a link, uh, there's, a, there's a short YouTube video, which I put in the show notes that you could see they're raised like Napoleon. There were two caskets, uh, Grant and his wife, Julia, and 
there's a bust of Sherman, uh, Sheridan, and uh, it's just really beautifully done. And uh, the largest um, individual, largest mausoleum in North America, you know, dedicated uh, to one person. It's a national park now uh, in New York City. You could see it from far in the distance. You could see the uh, th this <clears throat> structure. And it's a big part of New York, and, and so that's you know I think the he he went out the right way, and he's memorialized uh, the right way. Yep, this is a hero's tribute, you know, and 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 well deserved, yeah. you know, to to a great man yeah. and and uh, somebody who uh, was absolutely instrumental in defeating the Confederacy, reuniting the United States, and reuniting it yes. as a free country. You know, with 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 slavery, yeah. with slavery, As a free country. yeah, and deal and, and dealing with and empowering the blacks, American Indians, women, Jewish people. You know, all the ones who were kind of what we today call downtrodden. Grant was so far ahead of his time, giving equal rights to all, uh, and knowing that this age of enlightenment that he called it, nobody should be judged on race, color, or religion. You know, and America is the freest and richest country in the world, but we don't know it. And in a large sense, that's actually still true to this day, Andy. Yes. And so I think we could conclude by saying that Grant represents U.S. Grant, United States Grant, Rep U Ulysses Simpson yes. Grant, but United States Grant represents America at her best in many, many ways. Yes. I think he does. And so I want to yes. salute a great American hero here, uh, just a great hero uh, more broadly to Ulysses S. Grant. And Robert, I want to thank you for thank your you. knowledge on Grant and wish you, you know, to, to have a heroic day to, uh, for you and, and all of us, everybody out there in Hero Land. Let's try and lead more heroic lives. And we'll be back yes. next week once again Thanks. on The Hero Show. See you next week, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.